The next item of business is stage one debate on motion 15892 in the name of Kevin Stewart on the fuel poverty target definition and strategy Scotland Bill. And I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. I call on Kevin Stewart to speak to and move the motion for 12 minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I'm very pleased to uh, be opening this stage one debate on the fuel poverty target definition and strategy Scotland Bill. Uh, in this day and age, it's unacceptable that any Scottish household should have to make a choice between having the heating on and cooking their dinner. If Scotland is to become a fairer, more socially just society, it's crucial that we make a real headway towards ending the scourge of fuel poverty. Uh, we are ambitious in our aims. Our groundbreaking bill places Scotland amongst the best countries in the world in tackling fuel poverty. Not only are we one of just a few countries in the world to define fuel poverty, we are setting a goal towards eradicating it and we are changing the definition of fuel poverty so it's much more reflective of relative income poverty. And we are being revolutionary in our introduction of a minimum income standard. I want to thank the Local Government and Communities Committee uh, for its detailed examination of the bill and the clerks, stakeholders, organisations and individuals who have contributed to the scrutiny process and engaged with this bill. I appreciate all your work to make this bill as good as it can be. And I am, of course, pleased uh, that the committee's comprehensive report welcomes the bill and our draft fuel poverty strategy, as well as recommending Parliament agrees the general principles of the bill. Presiding officer, let me now turn to the bill's three key aims. The first of these is to set a target that by 2040, no more than 5% of Scottish households are in fuel poverty. The second aim is to capture in the definition of fuel poverty those folks who need help most. And we are therefore proposing a new definition of fuel poverty, which makes innovative use of the minimum income standard in order to better align fuel poverty with rel relative income poverty. Third, the bill ensures that a new long-term fuel poverty strategy be prepared, published and laid before Parliament. Crucially, in the preparation of this strategy, the bill ensures we consult people with lived experience of fuel poverty to ensure that our key measures and policies hit the mark. And I'm very grateful to Anne Lochray and the Fuel Poverty Advisory Panel and Partnership Forum for their help uh, in that regard. Once the strategy is published, ministers must report every five years on the steps taken, progress make, made towards meeting the target and the plan for the next reporting period. This reporting obligation will provide this and future governments with focus and momentum in the fight against fuel poverty. The bill has been the product of a thorough and collaborative process. In 2015, we set up two short life independent bodies to report on fuel poverty. Uh, the Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group and the Scottish Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force. Following on from their reports, an independent academic panel was tasked with reviewing the definition of fuel poverty and the majority of its recommendations have been incorporated into the definition of, the, of fuel poverty in the bill. Uh, we ran a fuel poverty strategy consultation uh, prior to publishing a draft fuel poverty strategy alongside the bill. And we also set up the Fuel Poverty Advisory Panel and Partnership Forum as part of a robust new framework for monitoring the progress in tackling fuel poverty and advising the government. And my officials and I have engaged widely uh, with stakeholders throughout this process and Parliament can be assured that we will continue to do so. And all of this shows just how serious the Scottish Government is about tackling fuel poverty. I've responded to the conclusions and the recommendations made by the committee and outlined where I agree with many of the re recommendations made and where I will bring forward amendments at stage two. Uh, and I'd like to take the opportunity uh, to talk uh, about some of those now. I welcome 
uh, the committee's support of the bill's major aim of setting a target that in 2040, no more than 5% of households in Scotland are in fuel poverty. I can also confirm my intention to introduce two interim 2030 targets. These are that the fuel poverty rate will be no more than 15% by 2030, and that the median fuel poverty gap is no more than £350 in 2015 prices before adding inflation. The government's ambition is simple, uh, to put an end to all fuel poverty, and we'll not stop working until that happens. All these targets go a long way to ensuring that we address both the severity of fuel poverty as well as its prevalence. And I therefore noted the committee's recommendation that we also include a target to tackle extreme fuel poverty. And I'm pleased to say today that I've listened to the committee and will bring forward a stage two amendment to define extreme fuel poverty and set a target relating to its eradication on the face of the bill. I would like now to turn to the committee's view uh, that the government should consider an amendment so that the 2045% target applies to all of Scotland's 32 local authorities. Uh, whilst we are committed to ensuring that folks are helped out of fuel, fuel poverty no matter where in Scotland they live, I'm keen to avoid a situation whereby some local authorities are set a goal that is unachievable and unrealistic. And I've set out my views in detail uh, in my response to the committee, but let me just express now uh, that I'm concerned with this pr proposal it doesn't seem to be evidence-led, and I'm particularly concerned that it has not been subject to any consultation. I've therefore written to COSLA to seek their views in detail, and in the meantime, note that they have already written to the committee expressing uh, their concerns on this matter. I welcome the committee's support of our proposed use of the UK minimum income standard in the measurement of fuel poverty. It will improve the alignment between fuel poverty and income poverty, and no one should un underestimate how important and innovative that move is. Over 80% of households which are fuel poor are also income poor under the proposed new definition, compared to just over 60% under the current definition. Those households that may not be income poor, but nevertheless struggle to pay their fuel bills and maintain an acceptable standard of living will also be captured by the new definition. At the same time, I understand the concerns that have been raised about the higher cost faced by those living in remote rural areas, remote small towns and island communities. So I've com carefully considered the uh, committee's recommendations and the views of stakeholders uh, that the government commits to introducing uh, an additional remote rural, remote small town and island MIS to reflect these costs. Uh, and in recognition of the unique challenges uh, these areas face in the fight against fuel, fuel poverty, I can confirm that I will bring forward an amendment at stage two to introduce a MIS uplift as the committee has requested for the areas which form categories four and six of the Scottish Government's six-fold urban rural, rural classification. I'm currently examining the options of how this can be best carried out uh, along with the costs involved and intend to write to the committee uh, to seek their views uh, ahead of lodging amendments. I'll, I'll give way to Mr. Liam MacArthur. I, I, I thank the Minister for giving way and, and, and also welcome what he's just said in relation to, to rural MIS. Uh, will he accept the, uh, that it is imperative that the basis on which that uplift is, um, is based is robust and independent and therefore the input of people like Professor Hurston Lus Lusborough uh, University must play a part in developing the policy going forward? Kevin Stewart. Um, can I assure uh, Mr. MacArthur that we have continued to speak to uh, Professor Hirsch during uh, the period between uh, the publication, uh, well, since his evidence actually, then after the publication of the Stage 1 report, and we will continue to do so. Um, I think it would be wrong of us uh, to introduce something that was not robust, um, and, you know, as I say, I will write to the committee giving options of how this best be carried forward. Uh, we'll seek their views uh, before I lay 
uh, amendments uh, for stage two. Um, I I'd like to thank Mr. MacArthur and others um, for uh, continuing to engage with the government during the course um, of all of this. Uh, we have uh, had some robust ex exchanges, some very good exchanges, uh, and long may that continue. Um, for our island communities, I, I want to emphasise that in addition to the commitment uh, on, uh, on MIS, the Scottish Government is in the process of conducting an island's impact assessment in respect of the bill. Uh, as the Chamber will know, uh, the provision of the Island Scotland Act are not yet in force and the guidance for these assessments is still in development. But our assessment will be in the spirit of the Act in partnership and consultation with island communities and the six relevant council authorities. The government is very much alive to the calls as expressed by uh, Mr. MacArthur and Alistair Allen uh, and others that the assessment should not be a desk-based exercise. And I'm firmly of the view that it is better for the Scottish government to take the time to produce a comprehensive and detailed assessment in partnership with island communities. Uh, I previously committed to publish this assessment uh, before stage three uh, and can confirm that this remains my intention and it will be published by the end of April. Let me now turn to uh, reporting on fuel poverty. I'm pragmatic uh, and open to persuasion that this needs to be more uh, frequent than every five years. That said, to avoid du duplication and promote coordination between different complementary government policies, I'm keen to coordinate the timeframe for reporting on fuel poverty with the timeframes for reporting on both energy efficiency and climate change. I want to ensure that fuel poverty reporting obligations do not place an undue burden on our local authority partners. And I'm aware that COSLA has written to the committee to express their concerns this might be the case. I also share their concerns that there is po the potential for this to detract from frontline delivery. I do not rule out introducing a stage two amendment to the bill to make the reporting obligation on fuel, fuel poverty more frequent, but would like to engage with COSLA further to understand their views and ensure we have the appropriate balance between their views and the views of the committee. As the Chamber will now be aware, um, I've carefully considered the views of the committee and aim to bring forward many of the uh, amendments that they have recommended. However, one area I, I cannot agree with is the suggestion uh, that the Scottish Fuel uh, Poverty Advisory Panel could be made statutory. In terms of its composition and structure, the panel is not the same as the Committee on Climate Change. It is key that the panel remains flexible and adaptable. And to maintain its role over the intended lifetime of our Fuel Poverty Act, the panel's membership and remit must keep pace with the changing landscape of fuel poverty, potential new technologies and opportunities and future partnerships. I also share COSLA's concern that the creation of a statutory body would risk diverting funding away from the core objective of supporting households out of fuel poverty. This is something that I'm sure no one would want to see. And I'm strongly of the view that this parliament can provide the scrutiny that is required to ensure that this government and those in the future keep on track the objectives that we all share. Presiding officer, I'm grateful that we have had the opportunity to discuss the aims of the Fuel Poverty Bill this afternoon uh, and look forward to hearing views uh, from all in the chamber. And I move that the parliament agrees to the general principles of the Fuel Poverty Target Definition and Strategy Scotland Bill. Thank you. I now call James Dornan on behalf of the Local Government and Communities Committee for 10 minutes, please, Mr Dornan. Thank you, President Officer, and I'm pleased to open this Stage 1 debate on the Fuel Poverty Target Definition and Strategy Scotland Bill on behalf of the Committee. I thank the Minister for responding to the report last week in time for today's debate. The Bill, as has already been stated by the Minister, primarily sets a target to reduce fuel poverty to no more than 5% of Scottish households by 2040, sets a new definition of fuel poverty, requires the government to bring forward a strategy to meet the target and puts in place reporting requirements. 
Recent statistics show that the fuel poverty affects 24.9 per cent of households. Excuse me, Mr. Scotland. Jordan, could you move your mic over a little bit? We really, <laughs> we really do want to hear you. My apologies. Uh, you want me to start again? Uh, recent statistics show that fuel poverty affects 24.9 per cent of households in Scotland, with some people and families struggling to pay for their fuel bills or heat their homes to an acceptable and comfortable level. Living in a cold, drafty home can have a negative impact on people's physical health and mental well-being and impact children's attainment. No person should have to choose between whether to eat or heat their homes, and therefore it is disappointing so many households remain in fuel poverty, despite previous efforts by administrations to tackle the issue. The bill before us has been informed by such previous efforts. Most recently, a target set in 2002 by the Liberal uh, Democrat Labour Executive that people are not living in fuel poverty by November 2016 was not met, and for good reason. Following a number of independent reviews and consultations led by the Scottish Government, it was strongly recommended that a new definition of fuel poverty was required, which more accurately identified those in financial distress in order to better target resources at those in the greatest need. I'll come back to the definition later in my speech. The Local Government and Communities Committee was appointed lead committee in scrutiny of the bill on the 5th of September 2018. We received 67 written responses to our calls for views, which closed on the 9th of November 2018. We promoted our scrutiny of the bill heavily on social media and held a number of oral evidence sessions with expert stakeholders. In addition to oral evidence taking, some committee members travelled to Dundee and the Western Isles to hear directly about the different experiences of those facing fuel poverty in both urban and rural communities. In doing so, we heard about the particular challenges faced by those on our islands. And I'd like to thank all those who provided written and oral evidence and all those who engaged with us during our scrutiny there. I now turn to some of our key recommendations. Section 1 of the bill puts in place a new target that by 2040, less than 5% of households in Scotland will be in fuel poverty. Whilst there was some debate around whether the target threshold should be set lower than 5%, we agreed that the target is achievable and strikes the right balance between realism and ambition, recognising that the Scottish Government has little or no influence over two of the four main drivers of fuel poverty. We do, however, acknowledge that the 5% should not limit future government's ambition and that a longer term focus should be on eradicating fuel poverty. There was also some debate around whether the end date of the target should be brought forward from 2040. The committee came to the view that given that reaching the target will rely on technologies that are still in development, it's realistic to build in time for these to come on, st on stream. It's also encouraging that the government has agreed to a recommendation to amend the bill to enshrine interim targets currently set out in the draft strategy accompanying the bill and statute. Specifically that, by 2030, the fuel poverty rate will be no more than 15% and that the medium fuel poverty gap will be no more than £350 uh, at uh, 2015 prices. It's hoped that such a measure could help prevent drift from reaching the target. We called on the Scottish Government to bring forward a separate target to tackle extreme poverty in order to prevent resources being targeted at low-hanging fruit, that is, the easiest to treat properties. Extreme poverty has previously been categorised as those households which have to spend 20% of their income in fuel. It is therefore welcome that the Minister is committed to bring forward proposals for a separate target for extreme poverty at stage two. I also note that the Government will give further consideration to the Committee's suggestion to apply local targets to address regional disparities. And I look forward to receiving an update from the Minister on the outcome of the Government's consultation with COSLA on the Committee's proposals. To more closely align fuel poverty with income poverty, Section 2 of the Bill puts in place a new definition in the Bill which assesses whether a household is in fuel poverty following the de deduction of housing costs such as rent, mortgage, council tax and water rates and also childcare costs. It uses an income threshold measure known as the Minimum inc Income Standard, MIS, to determine an acceptable standard of living. This was deemed necessary given that under the existing definition, a number of households considered as being fuel poor were not actually facing financial distress. The greater alignment between fuel poverty and income is welcome, as it will provide a more accurate picture of those experiencing fuel poverty. However, many express concern that the new definition does not accurately capture those facing fuel poverty in our island and remote rural communities. We therefore called for the Scottish Government to bring forward an additional rural MIS to recognise the higher costs faced by those communities. 
and it's therefore welcome again that the government has accepted this recommendation and we look forward to liaising with the Minister over this important change in the lead up to stage two. It's also encouraging that the government will carry out an island's impact assessment in the bill and associated strategy. We heard concerns that the complexity of the new definition could hinder delivery of services on the ground. We therefore call for more information on the Minister's thinking around the development of a doorstep tool and how proxies will be used alongside the new definition to better identify those in fuel poverty. It's helpful to have received clarification from the Minister that the use of proxies will continue and that the Government, alongside COSLA, will consider further what tools and guidance are necessary for councils to target resources at those with the greatest need. Sections 3 to 5 of the Bill require the Scottish Government to prepare a fuel poverty strategy, setting out how the 2040 target will be achieved. It also sets out the consultation requirements for the strategy and its publication and laying requirements. The Committee agreed with these proposals, particularly the requirement to involve those with lived experiences of fuel poverty. However, we also agree with our witnesses that this should be a collaborative and not a top-down process. Turning to the contents of the draft fuel poverty strategy, which was published alongside the bill, it's welcome that the Minister will listen to the views of our stakeholders on suggested improvements as part of an ongoing engagement with them. I was particularly encouraged that the Minister will look to improve the strategy in relation to the list of issues highlighted in paragraph 199 of our report, including how fuel poverty will be tackled in the private housing sector, our rural and island communities, and the actions the Scottish Government will take to address all four drivers of fuel poverty including those which are primarily the responsibility of the UK Government. As set out in our report, we have written to the UK Government regarding problems caused to people's houses by works carried out under UK-based energy efficiency schemes. We heard of serious misgivings about the administration of some of these schemes, and it's encouraging that the Government is also pursuing this matter with the UK Government. Well, Mr. Of course. Kevin Stewart. I'm, I'm very grateful um, for the committee uh, looking at the situation around about the UK schemes. Um, and as Mr Dornan has uh, pointed out, um, the Scottish Government has been on to the UK Government on a number of occasions uh, around about trying to deal uh, with some of the real difficulties that have been caused. Uh, and I'm very grateful to the committee um, for their efforts in joining with the Government uh, to try and seek resolution here. Uh, and I would appreciate as we move forward that we continue to liaise on this matter because we must do uh, all that we can to get the UK government to see sense uh, around about those folks that are suffering because of Helms and others. James Dornan. Yeah, I want to thank the Minister for that and I can assure him that the committee will be happy to liaise with the, the Minister regarding those letters. The bill requires Scottish ministers to, to lay periodic reports on the steps taken and progress towards reaching the target of 2040 alongside the steps that will be taken in the next reporting period to meet the target. It's welcome that the government will report on progress in relation to all four drivers of fuel poverty. The bill currently provides that these should be every five years. However, given concerns raised, we have recommended that these be carried out every three years. The vast majority of those we heard for call for more frequent reporting. I do know that the government will consult with COSLA on the viability of increasing the frequency of reporting, and I look forward to an update in due course. Finally, it's disappointing that the government has not accepted our recommendation to put the Scottish Fuel Poverty Advisory Panel on a statutory footing to provide an independent scrutiny role. However, the Minister has provided the committee with clear reasons to why this has not been accepted. As the Minister notes, the Parliament will no doubt pay close attention to the government's progress towards meeting the target, as well the steps as it will take going forward, as new technologies which are required in the fight against fuel poverty are developed. Before concluding, I'd like to put on record my thanks to the committee, clerks and spice officials for all their assistance during the stage one process and all those people who gave evidence either in person or in writing. And presiding officer, this bill has the potential to make a difference to the lives of many families in Scotland. However, the real test will be whether the measures and strategies that accompany it are practical, deliverable and robust. And it will be the job of this parliament to keep a watch on this in the coming years. The committee commends the bill to the Parliament and recommends that the Parliament agrees to its general principles. Thank you. Paul Graham Simpson for eight minutes, please. Thank you. Um, this should have been an exciting and far-reaching piece of legislation, but it's anything but that. It can change, though. You could replace the six pages of the bill with a six-line press release and achieve the same thing. In 2016, the SNP made a manifesto pledge 
to introduce the Warm Homes Bill. In November 2017, the Scottish Government said, quote, eradicating fuel poverty is crucial to making Scotland fairer, and that's why we're proposing that the key purpose of the Warm Homes Bill will be to enshrine in legislation our long-term ambition to eradicate fuel poverty. And here we are in 2019 with a fuel poverty bill, not a Warm Homes Bill, which doesn't set a target to eradicate fuel poverty. The bill itself even states its purpose as an act of the Scottish Parliament to set a target relating to the eradication of fuel poverty, not to set a target for the eradication of fuel poverty, which would have meant something, but relating to it. That's a far cry from the words issued by the Scottish Government in 2017. The bill is well-meaning, but it lacks ambition. First, it sets a new definition of fuel poverty. It says that once a household has paid for its housing, uh, it's in fuel poverty if it needs more than 10% of its remaining income to pay for its energy needs. Uh, and if this then leaves the household in poverty, that seems fair enough. It sets a target of reducing fuel poverty to 5% within, wait for it, 21 years. Just... Yes. Kenneth Gibson. I'm actually quite surprised by the, the, the speech so far and the tone of it. My understanding on the committee was that we were more or less consensual in that committee. And I don't remember you or any other colleague dissenting for any of the specifics, including the 2040 date when we put that report together. Always through the chair, please, Graham Simpson. Yeah, um, Mr Gibson is well aware of how committee reports are put together. Uh, members are entitled to... Uh, uh, give an alternative uh, opinion in debates like this. Um, who's going to be accountable uh, for that date uh, in 21 years' time? Ruth Davidson could be in her fourth term as First Minister by then. Her son could have graduated, but can't see most of us being here. Uh, so with something so far into the distance, the Local Government Committee was entirely right to suggest statutory interim milestones that could prevent ministers wriggling off the hook uh, along the way. I tend towards the view expressed by the existing Homes Alliance that the bill should be amended to ensure corrective action is taken if targets aren't oh, met. I won't on this occasion. Because if that isn't the case, uh, then all we'll get will be a government shrug of the shoulders and quite possibly an attempt to blame someone else. All that said, uh, I'm still carefully considering whether to submit an amendment moving the target date forward. The committee did some sterling work, as we've heard. We visited Dundee and Stornoway. In Dundee, we heard about the problems that people using prepayment meters have if they want to switch providers. We saw how area-based schemes can successfully lift people out of fuel poverty and help their health at the same time. In Stornoway, one of the bill's serious omissions was brought home to us. Uh, the refusal when using the minimum income standard to define fuel poverty to, to reflect the higher costs incurred by people living in islands, remote towns, and remote rural areas. Uh, and I would say, no, no, because I'm about to praise you. Um, uh, <laughs> and I do praise uh, the minister for agreeing to uh, amend the bill uh, to reflect the committee's views on this. Fuel poverty rates in urban Scotland have improved since 2015, but rates in rural areas haven't improved, so there's a widening gap. We have a legislative vacuum that simply must be filled at stage two, and a number of stakeholders agree. We also heard of contractors carrying out substandard work under UK government-funded schemes and of lax monitoring. I've heard of this before, and it doesn't interest me one bit which government is to blame, if that's the right word. I insisted that we mentioned this uh, in the committee's report and the convener, as he said, has written to the minister, Claire Perry, about it. Now, much has been made of the target to reduce fuel poverty to 5%. A number of groups, including Energy Action Scotland, believe it's not ambitious enough. But even though, as Spice have said, that could mean 140,000 households living in fuel poverty, and that's 140,000 too many, it will never be possible to completely eradicate <coughs> fuel poverty. People will move in and out of fuel poverty as their circumstances change. And of course, it's not possible to know about everybody's circumstances. 
One thing the committee said, which has caused some pushback, uh, is that 5% should be achieved in every single council area. Kosler didn't like that. Uh, the minister, as he said earlier, didn't like it. But the reason behind that was that so, so that no area slips through the net. I accept that probably more work needs to be done on this. The bill commits ministers to preparing a fuel poverty strategy. Helpfully, they produced a draft one um, in which the minister describes the bill as a landmark piece of legislation. One of the best ways of reducing fuel poverty is to ensure homes are as energy efficient as possible. The strategy says all domestic properties are required to achieve an energy performance certificate um, rating of at least EPC3 by 2040 at the latest. It doesn't say how this will come about and it doesn't recognize the very real concerns with using EPCs and their accuracy or lack of it. Nor does it say anything about real action on making new and refurbished homes as near to passive house standard as possible. I've repeatedly pushed the minister on this, um, but it's time for action. There was much disappointment when this bill was published. There'll be a clamor to amend it. Opposition members are already being sent suggestions. Um, I hope the minister has learned from his bitter experience in the planning bill that he should be engaging with us uh, in detail right now. Yes. Kevin Mr Church. Simpson uh, well knows that I will engage with anyone and everyone uh, and I've done so throughout uh, this uh, bill and others. Some members uh, take the opportunity uh, to come and speak to me. Um, stakeholders have always got the opportunity to come and speak to me. Some of the reasoning for the changes that have already been made in terms of amendments at stage two are because of discussions. Um, I don't appreciate the fact that Mr. Simpson is trying to insinuate um, that there has been no discussion around about this because I met with him and Mr. Stewart at the very early stages and would do so again if there's a request to do so. Graham Simpson. And I do think the Minister has learned his lesson because he did have a discussion with me and Mr. Stewart and he has responded well to the c c committee's report. Uh, he, he has said he will bring forward uh, very helpful amendments, so it will be uh, in nobody's interest uh, if we don't move forward uh, along those lines. We on these benches uh, at the moment are pretty underwhelmed by this bill, uh, but we think it can be improved, so we'll support it at stage one. Pauline McNeill, seven minutes, please. Presiding officer, I'd like to begin by thanking the Local Government and Communities Committee for what I thought was a lengthy but really excellent piece of work. Um, I confess I didn't read all of it, but I, I know you went into real detail in the work that you did here. Um, and I wondered if Ruth Davidson might be watching the Parliament, who knows, on her maternity leave. I thought, I wonder what she thought about Graeme Simpson committing her to another four terms in this place. However, the rest of us are slightly alarmed at that. Um, like everyone else, um, I believe that every single Scot has the right to live in a warm, affordable and secure home. Unfortunately, we're a long way from that reality as over just a quarter of households in Scotland live in fuel poverty. And for those of you who watched the, uh, who watched, uh, the recent announcement on the 1st of April, more than one million households in Scotland will be looking at an average rise of £110 a year after the energy watchdog off gym increased the cap for the default tariff which most people are on and i think this is a really important point even people who should know better that there are cheaper deals the vast majority of them are on these default tariffs and off gym is the organization that as many protect the consumer you switch has warned that larger families in Scotland could see their annual bills rise by up to £184 a year. And Age Scotland have responded to the rising cap by saying it will do nothing to tackle fuel poverty. And indeed, it makes a mockery of the term cap. I'd be happy to take an intervention. Kevin Stewart. Thank Ms McNeill for taking the intervention, presiding officer. And I agree completely and utterly with her on that front. And it is a great pity 
um, that out of the drivers of fuel poverty, that this parliament has no control over fuel prices or income. Uh, between 2003 um, four and 2017, median households uh, income in Scotland rose by 50%. And at the same time, fuel prices rose by 158%. And while I'm grateful that there is a cap in place now, that does not go far enough. I believe that this parliament should have control over that. And I hope that Ms McNeill uh, will consider supporting us in that regard. Pauline McNeill. I'm on record as saying that someone should certainly have control over it and that certainly is something I'm willing to discuss because even the Westminster Parliament does not have control over energy prices. But I'm sure the Minister will take the most relevant point here um, that there's going to be more people living in fuel poverty as energy prices begin to rise. And while we encourage people to switch to cheaper tariffs and the consumer organisation which recently carried out research indicates that energy companies have dramatically reduced the number of cheaper deals available. So price is obviously only one factor in all of that. And by reducing those cheaper deals, there will definitely be less cheaper fuel available. But like Graham Simpson, I don't see it as a groundbreaking bill. I don't see it as revolutionary. I do think we could get there at stage three. So Labour welcomes the introduction of the Fuel Poverty Targets Bill, but we think it falls short in many areas. It is a narrowly drawn bill, and I think it's a huge mistake to draw it so narrowly. The existing Homes Alliance said we have once in a lifetime opportunity to tackle it, and we must take it. We want to eradicate fuel poverty for good. I know we all do. I do welcome what the Minister has said today on the forthcoming amendments on interim targets, and extreme fuel poverty being on the face of the bill. That is wholly welcomed by us. But I believe that the delivery section of the bill should have reflected more of the format of the Jail Poverty Act, because in that act, it does attempt to set out areas where we can begin to improve. And in this case, it would be improving energy efficiency to reduce energy costs to householders. How else are we to achieve the targets it has to sound more like real ambition to prevent more people from living in cold, drafty homes. And how does Scottish Government actually intend to achieve that? We need delivery on helping poorer households. As Citizens Advice Scotland has said that those who found it most difficult to afford to pay their energy bills were less likely to have access to support. Ministers, I believe, should still be having discussions with the big six and other suppliers about improving emergency credit schemes and helping the most vulnerable customers. Um, I see the Minister nodding. There's a lot of work to be done in this area. Most concerning with yet another price hike is even more customers struggling to pay their bills, but particularly those who are already vulnerable. Ofgem is currently consulting on their consumer vulnerability strategy, and it's important that we see more standardisation across the sector. Energy companies are supposed to have a priority services register, but there is currently no standard qualifying criteria for vulnerable households to be placed on the register. More than ever, we need to find a way to ensure that companies take vulnerable customers off these standard variable tariffs and place on a more favourable deal. And I think even through discussion, more could be done to force companies to do that. Much has been said so far, very quickly, not a long intervention, please, Kevin presiding Stewart. officer. Like you thank, got there before I did. Thank, <laughs> thank you, presiding officer. Um, the government uh, has engaged with the big six and others on this. Uh, and what I would welcome is cross-party support right across this chamber uh, so that we can act uh, together uh, to put the pressure on these companies to see sense in these regards. Well, thank I you I can give that. you a little you extra will definitely time. definitely have Ms. our Neil. support on that. Um, and just in have I got a minute to finish? I can up? give you a little extra time, yes. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just wanted to say a little bit about rural communities. It has been well covered by Graham Simpson and by James Dornan. More than two-fifths of Scots live in rural areas and they're estimated to be suffering from fuel poverty by huge figures, that's for sure. It's clear that an adjustment needs to be made to the definition of fuel poverty. And I heard what the minister said earlier, so I think we need to see the detail of that. I think that's to be particularly welcomed for those communities because it's quite clear it's to be much harder to get their energy costs down while they don't get the same access to the national grid. So that is wholly welcomed. But we also need to look at lifting the level of the warm homes discount for households in rural areas to recognise the high levels of fuel poverty. Uh, Graeme Simpson has spoken many times about the private rental sector. I want to add my voice to that too. 
because private renters are more likely to live in a house that requires critical and urgent disrepair and has failed the Scottish housing quality standard, which often means living in a home with insufficient insulation. If you live in the private renter sector, you are twice as likely to be living in uh, fuel poverty with the lowest EPC bans. The rates of fuel poverty are above the national average. So I do think that we do need to focus in the delivery plan towards the private sector to see what action can be taken to lift those households out of poverty. Furthermore, I think we need to make it easier for homeowners in particular, and those homeowners who might be able to pay a bit towards home energy efficiency to get government support. I confess, I find a whole myriad of loans and grants under the schemes quite complicated to follow, um, and I have studied it, but goodness knows what a householder makes of it. We need to do more to give them confidence to apply to what I believe are very good schemes. And I call on the Scottish Government to advertise their zero interest rate loan scheme and review how more people could be helped. I think that there are more people who are able to pay, but with government support back, might be prepared to make the jump and make their houses more fuel efficient. Conclusion, presiding officer, we must eradicate fuel poverty once and for all. We must be ambitious for the fuel poor. We're only at stage one. By stage three, with a consensus, I believe we can achieve it. Thank you. Andy Whiteman, six minutes, please. Uh, thanks very much, presiding officer. Uh, and like others, I'd like to thank uh, my committee colleagues, Clark, Spice, and all those who gave evidence <coughs> and to the many groups who submitted briefings for today. Uh, and like the Minister as well, I want to pay tribute to the Scottish Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group and the Scottish Fuel Poverty, Scottish Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force, uh, chaired by David Sigworth uh, and Di Alexander, whose work uh, uh, contributed so much to um, this uh, bill. Uh, we know the statistics from the Scottish Household uh, House Conditions Survey, uh, seven uh, quarter of households living in fuel poverty uh, and about 7% living in extreme fuel poverty. Unacceptable, uh, and we need to tackle it. And while I welcome the Scottish Government's response to the committee's report, uh, which states that if we reach the target, and I quote, Scotland will be amongst the very best in the world in terms of tackling fuel poverty, it's clear to me that we have an awful lot of work to do to reach that uh, ambition. And I just want to set out uh, the Greens' position and where we'll be seeking to make some changes at stage two. And it's worth noting that a bill that focused on targets, definitions and strategies takes us only so far. A number of members have already mentioned the fact that we were promised a warm homes bill uh, that was abandoned. Um, and we have targets, definitions and strategies. Now, delivery against a target will require that we integrate policies around uh, climate change, the built environment, energy, health, uh, etc. And I welcome the Minister's commitment to align some reporting there, which I think would be uh, helpful. The committee deliberated at length on the target and it was the focus of much evidence. And in light of the failure to achieve the previous target set in 2002, I think it's right that we take a more critical and a more sceptical view uh, this time round. Uh, we welcome the commitment to interim statutory targets, but the 2040 target has been criticised as not being ambitious enough. The committee took the view that this was OK because it was pragmatic. But I believe that with enhanced reporting and scrutiny, there should be the ability to review whether progress can be made more quickly over the next years. And a 2032 target does reflect a higher level of ambition and is preferable. If it cannot be achieved, we will know in advance. Happy. Annabelle Ewing. I'm grateful to them for taking this mention. Remember, we'll remember, obviously, in committee as well, that one of the issues um, that was raised with regard to uh, uh, an earlier target was the issue of emerging technologies uh, and that there would need to be the, the time uh, uh, for them to bed in and to be indeed to be developed and to be available at a reasonable price to individuals in Scotland. Would the member not take into account that that indeed is a factor in this debate? Andy Whiteman. Y yes, I agree entirely that emerging technologies are going to be critical and they may be slow to arise, they may be faster. Uh, to arise. I don't think we should make any predictions just now on how fast uh, they might uh, uh, arrive. Uh, there's also an issue with words in this bill. The long title of the bill talks about setting a target relating to the eradication of fuel poverty, but given the intention is to reduce it to 5%, uh, we should be more honest about the ambition and set a target relating to uh, reduction. 
There's also been a lot of talk about the four drivers of fuel poverty, the cost of energy, energy efficiency, household income, and household behaviours. And the fact that in Scotland, we're really only in control of the first, uh, of energy efficiency uh, and household behaviours. Now, in its response to the committee's report, the government claims that it only has significant control of one of the four drivers of fuel poverty, that being home energy efficiency. Uh, and the minister indeed repeated that uh, in an intervention on Pauline McNeill. Now, I disagree uh, with that contention. The bill makes clear that the definition of fuel poverty is based on a minimum income standard. Now, whilst gross incomes are not within the significant control of the Scottish Parliament government, or indeed the UK Parliament, it's not gross incomes that define fuel poverty, it's net incomes. After housing costs, fuel costs, childcare and council tax, and after, of course, income taxes. And these are all within the very direct influence of devolved powers. We can enhance people's net incomes by reducing housing costs, by reducing taxation, by enhanced provision of childcare, etc. So my view is the Scottish Government does have significant control over this area to adjust income tax levels, to ensure that the most vulnerable are not driven into fuel poverty in the first place, for example. A uh, brief, thank you. Annabel Ewing. I'm grateful. What about national insurance? Sadly, this Parliament doesn't have control over it. Andy Whiteman. Absolutely. I, I'm not arguing that Parliament has complete control over net income. What I am arguing is it has substantial control over people's uh, net incomes. Um, another aspect of the bill that's been much commented on is the question of minimum income standard uplifts for remote and rural Scotland. And I welcome the Minister's commitment to look at options in this area, and in particular to consult the committee uh, in advance of stage three. I think it's a very productive way to proceed, and I hope will improve uh, the bill. Finally, I want to say a few words about scrutiny. Other members who have been here uh, longer than I have, I'm looking at Jackie Bailey uh, amongst others, will have views on why the 2002 target was not met by 2016. Clearly we know that rising fuel prices contributed considerably, for example. But failure to meet a target is a possibility going forward as well, for all sorts of reasons we may not know, uh, we do not know uh, at the moment. And the critical thing is to keep the target under review. Now the bill makes provision for reporting in section six, but reporting is not scrutiny, especially when reports are laid by Scottish ministers who themselves have substantial responsibility for delivering. It's already been mentioned that other legislation enshrining targets, such as the Climate Change Act and Child Poverty Acts, Act embed independent statutory scrutiny mechanisms. Now, the committee recommends this in Para 219, and I'm disappointed that ministers don't accept it. Now, I'm not precious about how such independent scrutiny is achieved. The committee suggested the Fuel Poverty Advisory Group be placed in a statutory footing, and that might be one option. But there are other options. The critical thing is we have independent monitoring and scrutiny, because for the public to be able to assess whether progress has been made, whether progress could be made faster or slower, uh, in account of emerging technologies, etc., is really, really important. And I don't think the Parliament alone can do that scrutiny job. To conclude, Presiding Officer, this bill does represent an important part of tackling uh, fuel poverty, but it's not in a fit state to deliver what's required. I look forward to working with other members and engaging with the ministers in stage two. Liam MacArthur, six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President. Also, can I thank James Dornan uh, and his committee, uh, both for the report, but also for allowing me to play my part in the stage one scrutiny of this important uh, bill. I am grateful, too, to all those who gave oral and written evidence, uh, which I found invaluable, not least in shining a light on ways to improve and strengthen the current bill, giving greater urgency and ambition to our collective efforts uh, at tackling a problem that blights too many uh, households in too many communities across the country. Uh, to the surprise of no one, I intend to focus much of my remarks on how we might use this bill to more effectively um, to address the issue uh, as it affects rural and island areas, uh, a theme that Kenneth Gibson and I, uh, I think, give a good and regular airing to Act Committee. But first, I think it's worth reflecting on why this bill matters so much and why it's essential we show more ambition in what we seek to achieve. As the existing Homes Alliance remind us, the benefits of reducing fuel poverty go far beyond simply removing the need for people to choose between heating their home or eating a meal. All the evidence shows that lifting people out of fuel poverty helps improve their physical and mental health. Uh, unsurprisingly, living in a warm, dry home helps uh, increase uh, educational attainment as well. Local jobs are created and skills enhanced in the energy efficiency and low carbon heat industries, while households have greater energy security 
and money to spend. And our ambitions for tackling climate change rely on us making progress in improving the energy efficiency of our housing, housing stock. So for all these reasons and more, this bill matters. And it matters, of course, to communities throughout Scotland. Few, if any, are immune from fuel poverty. That said, rural and island areas are disproportionately affected, with Orkney suffering the dubious honour of having the highest proportion of households in fuel poverty and extreme fuel, fuel poverty. It's an honour uh, we are keen to relinquish. But it underscores the particular importance of this bill and the fuel poverty strategy, recognising and taking specific steps to address fuel poverty in remote, rural and island communities. So while the change in definition contained in the bill makes sense, it does not, as things stand, adequately take into account the additional costs associated with living in remote and rural areas of Scotland. Indeed, it ignores the key recommendation of the government's own Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force, ably chaired by Diane Alexander, whose evidence to the committee uh, on this was compelling. He set out in clear and cogent terms the rationale for using a separate minimum income standard for remote, rural and island areas, reflecting the additional co cost borne by those living in such communities. It was a view shared not just by most of those who gave evidence on this part of the bill, uh, but one universally supported by every council, housing association and fuel poverty group uh, in the Highlands and Islands. It is a case that is unanswerable. I welcome the fact that the committee uh, recognised that. I welcome, too, the fact that the Minister uh, has shown his willingness to engage with me and others over recent months in a bid to find a solution. His commitment to undertaking uh, an island's impact assessment is very welcome, not just on this bill, but hopefully on the future strategy as well, uh, as is his commitment to an appropriate uplift for rural and island areas. I look forward to seeing the detail of that, but I agree with Di Alexander that there's a strong case for two separate up uplifts reflecting the additional costs associated with living on an island. He is also right that we must find a robust, independent way of assessing the appropriate level of uplift now and into the future. Professor Hirsch and the team at Loughborough University seem to be key to achieving this, but it must be enshrined in legislation and I look forward uh, to seeing what uh, work can be uh, progressed in this area at stage two. I think the review and redesign of fuel poverty uh, proxies, which tend to be urban orientated, is also needed and should be independent of government. Meantime, it's encouraging to see the consensus over the need for distinguishing between fuel poverty on the one hand and extreme fuel poverty on the other. Despite the best intentions uh, of successive administrations, there's been, there's been, I believe, a collective failure to make a meaningful impact on behalf of those in most need. That must change, and I support the call for a separate target for eliminating extreme fuel poverty by 2024. In terms of the targets, generally there were concerns about what is seen uh, by many as a lack of uh, ambition in the bill. Energy Action Scotland suggests the 2040 date is, quote, effectively a generation away and feels like out of sight, out of mind. The existing Homes Alliance point out that reducing fuel poverty from 24% today to 5% in 2040 represents around 1% a year. And this hardly feels like the level of ambition we need uh, and, and should be uh, showing condemning potentially up to 140,000 households to be, remain in fuel poverty by 2040. So again, I support calls for bringing forward the, the deadline, if not to 2032, then certainly earlier than 2040. In addition, the proposal for statutory interim targets makes sense, as do calls for changes uh, to the Household Condition Survey, allowing an early indication of where the strategy is working and where it is not working to allow changes to be made. I welcome the committee's call to see steps taken to ensure progress in every local authority area in Scotland. While it may be impossible to ensure entirely even rates of progress across the board, we can't have a situation where investment and effort is targeted in areas with larger populations uh, in order to hit the numbers rather than communities oh, where need is greater. Sir, I will e extremely quickly, yes. like um, extreme. Mr MacArthur already knows that um, uh, in terms of uh, spend, we spend three times per mu mu more per head of population in islands than we do uh, on mainland authorities. Um, that is something that we have continued to do as a government, recognising the differences that there are there. Extremely quickly means to, quickly, to, to Minister. Focus on that urban element there. 
Liam McCarthy. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I don't dispute the uh, additional investment made, but in a sense, the levels of fuel poverty um, need to be brought down across the board. And I think consistently the, the expectations in Ireland and rural areas are every bit as uh, legitimate as those living in urban areas. I see no good reason why the advisory panel should not be put on a, a statutory basis. Uh, robust, independent and effective advice to minister in the wider policy making process is required. Presiding officer, while narrower in scope than the Warm Homes Bill originally uh, promised, this bill has the potential to make a real uh, difference. As Parliament embarks on stage two consideration of the bill, we should resist the temptation to play safe, to build in wiggle room or to keep kicking the can down the road. It's an opportunity to be ambitious, bold and eradicate the scourge of fuel poverty. I look forward to working with the Minister and other colleagues across the Chamber at stage two, but we'll be supporting the bill this evening. Thank you. Okay, we now move on to the open debate. You may have noticed there were a lot of interventions, some of them quite lengthy during the, the opening speeches, so I have no spare time left. Speeches of six minutes, Annabel Ewing, followed by Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to have been called to speak in this stage one debate on the Fuel Poverty Target Definition Strategy Bill, not least as I have the pleasure of being a member of the Local Government Committee, which recently completed its scrutiny of the bill at stage one. I would say at the outset, Presiding Officer, just to remind everybody that Scotland is an energy rich nation, yet we still see many of our citizens living in fuel poverty. That is as unacceptable as it is absurd. But we know in that regard that two of the key drivers of fuel poverty, energy prices and household incomes, fall, as far as government interventions are concerned, broadly within the powers of the Westminster Parliament and not our Scottish Parliament, a situation that the unionist parties are sadly content to see continue. But what we... Yes, I will. Andy Whiteman. Annabel Ewing for taking an intervention. Does she accept that the minimum income standard does relate to net incomes? And whilst everyone's income will, will, will differ, the difference between gross incomes and net com incomes is quite considerable. And the difference is substantially attributed to powers that are devolved. Annabel Ewing. I, I hear what the member says, but I've, as I already said in the intervention, for example, uh, national insurance uh, does not fall within the jurisdiction of this place. For example, this parliament has control over only 15% of the total expenditure on social security. So to name just but two issues, uh, I think the member would accept that this parliament does not have all the economic levers that impact on individual household incomes. But what we are determined to do, nonetheless, presiding officer, is to place Scotland amongst the very best in the world in seeking to tackle fuel poverty and to secure that laudable and ambitious objective. The bill sets forth both a target for the reduction of fuel poverty and an express definition of fuel poverty, as we have heard. And I think it is worth noting in that respect, presiding officer, that Scotland is one of only a handful of European countries to do so. The target set is, as we have heard, to reduce fuel poverty to no more than 5% of households in Scotland by 2040. And as the convener of the committee has said, the committee did consider that this 5% target uh, approach struck an appropriate balance as between realism and ambition. And in so doing, it recognised both the limited powers of the devolution settlement and the fact that individual households move in and out of fuel poverty as a result of changing circumstances. However, I do welcome the Minister's recognition in his response to the committee's stage one report of the need to work in the long term for the eradication of fuel poverty to the extent that this is realistically possible. As regards the period of time within which the target is to be achieved, it is worth noting, as has been mentioned, that there were differing views uh, from those who gave evidence to the committee. While some favoured the 2040 date, recognising, amongst other things, as I referred to in an intervention, that achieving the target will rely on emerging technologies still in development, others took the view that the time period was too long. Uh, that seems now to include the secret views of fellow member Mr Simpson. It is to be welcomed, therefore, that the Minister has responded favourably to the committee's concerns and has agreed to bring forward amendments at stage two. That would put on the face of the bill interim 2030 targets, as the Minister has said. Uh, these would relate to the fact that the fuel poverty rate is to be no more than 15% by 2030 and that by that date, the median fuel poverty gap will be no more than £350 in terms of 2015 prices before inflation. As far as the definition of fuel poverty is concerned, the revised definition set out in the bill based around the minimum income standard was broadly welcomed with the key discussions concerning the introduction of an additional MIS, an uplift to the MIS to reflect the higher costs of those living on islands, remote small towns and remote rural areas. 
And I am pleased to say that the Minister also listened to the committee on this important point and has confirmed that options as to how to achieve this objective are actively being considered. That is also the case with regards to the committee's calls to set a separate target for extreme fuel poverty, that is those who have to spend more than 20% of their income on fuel. Given the position of many of my constituents in Cowdenbeath, I'm also pleased to note that although the age vulnerability threshold has been extended from 60 years of age to 75, nonetheless, those with disabilities and long-term illnesses will be recognised as needing enhanced heating, therefore capturing a significant number of those in the 60 to 75 age cohort. A draft fuel strategy has been published alongside the bill and is very much a work of pro progress at this stage. Uh, however, it is important that the government proceed to develop the strategy with the fullest engagement, not just with representative organisations, but with actual individuals who have experience of living in fuel poverty. And that would ensure, in my view, that the pivotal role that the fuel strategy will play in delivery can, in fact, be secured. In closing my remarks, presiding officer, I think it is important to recall that this bill is indeed a framework bill and it must be seen in the context of the suite of measures planned or in the pipeline concerning both energy efficiency and carbon emissions reductions. Working across portfolios is indeed the only way to tackle both fuel poverty and climate change and to ensure therefore that people can heat their homes affordably and by use of low carbon heating technologies. We have with this bill, presiding officer, an opportunity to reset the agenda and to make a real difference to the lives of not just my constituents in Cowdenbeath, but to citizens right across Scotland. I am pleased, therefore, presiding officer, to support the Fuel Poverty Bill. Thank you. Alexander Burnett, followed by Alistair Allen. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I note members to my register of interest on this bill in relation to energy efficiency. Now, as my colleague Graham Simpson mentioned in his opening speech, this bill is an important one for Scotland but in its current form fails to outline how the Scottish Government will be held accountable if it does not meet the target outlined. Now, Scotland has always been a country with great ambition, but right now this SNP Government is failing us with these targets. And we're not alone in thinking that this Bill's focus is too narrow. The existing Homes Alliance said that the scope should be widened to help tackle energy efficiency and support the achievement of warm, affordable, low-carbon homes for everybody. And members across the Chamber will remember that last May, an amendment of mine was successfully passed with the support of Labour, the Liberal Democrats and the Greens. And this sought to have a target for all homes reaching the EPCC rating, where feasibly possible, by no later than 2030, as opposed to the current target of 2040. And at this point in time, the Scottish Government has failed to honour the will of the Scottish Parliament and are pushing ahead with their 2040 target instead. Now, this might come as a surprise to SNP members, but we want to work with you to help achieve ambitious but attainable targets. And it is not just the target date that we want to see improved, but we also wish to see the method by which EPCs are produced to be reviewed. In December last year, a common wheel article stated how the method is fundamentally flawed, particularly due to the reliance on the used modeled energy consumption data rather than actual measured data. And just recently, a constituent was in touch as they had had two EP assessments done within two years by the same contractor with completely different outcomes. So either we need to see a review on how EPCs are produced or an alternative is needed to ensure that they are more accurate and standardized. Because as the Common Wheel article mentions, if a household is under or overestimated on their energy consumption by an inaccurate EPC rating, residents for either face higher than expected energy bills or it deters them from making behavioural changes and investing in making energy efficiency improvements. Now, being an MSP who represents a rural area, I must also add my concerns that the bill does not consider the added cost for those living in rural communities. And I was pleased to see in the committee's report that this was requested of the government and I hope that it will be acted on as we heard the minister uh, talk in his opening sp uh, speech. And the minimum income standard is another important yet contentious point. A review is required for a spot Scotland specific version, which would consider remote and rural households. But we must also take into account concerns such as those raised by the Scottish Older People's Assembly, that the new definition is likely to result in fewer households with older people being considered fuel poor. And whilst I wish to see rural communities protected, 
this should not be at the detriment to other sections of society. And herein lies a difficulty with a 5% target. Yes, a great start, but it means there is a risk of leaving those who are at most need still in fuel poverty, such as our vulnerable in society and rural communities. Mm -hmm. And therefore I join my colleagues in calling for a separate target, looking to eradicate extreme fuel poverty, to ensure that those hardest to reach are not left in this 5% bracket. And I would also be keen to see that each local authority was set to have its own 5% target so that no area of Scotland is disadvantaged by a national average weighted in favour of a predominantly urban central belt. Uh, no, I won't. I've got a number of points. Um, now, whilst the bill brings about lots of good action points on how to reduce fuel poverty, I am concerned that the financial memorandum does not estimate the actual cost of eradicating fuel poverty. So surely this bill should allocate extra cost in order to tackle this issue. And it shows exactly why this bill is not going far enough if the Scottish Government does not even think it merits additional funding in order to achieve its goals. And even the committee reported that they were surprised that the Government provided estimated costing for meeting climate change targets, yet chose not to take the same approach for this bill. Now, the Scottish Conservatives' proposal... I won't take an intervention. I know the Minister's uh, got a closing speech as well. I do recognise the points he's made uh, in response to the committee's report, and we look forward uh, to seeing them when they, when they uh, materialise. Now, the Scottish Conservatives' proposal is to invest up to 10% of the Scottish Government's capital budget allocations in en energy efficiency measures. This policy will make more homes warmer than the SNP proposals, eradicate fuel poverty at a greater rate than the SNP proposals, and reduce carbon emissions faster than the SNP proposals, all whilst growing businesses and the economy across the whole of Scotland. So whilst this bill is a step in the right direction and we fully support its principles, it still needs to do more. So at this stage, my colleagues and I look to support the bill, but wish to continue working with members across the chamber to ensure that it can be strengthened. Thank you. Alistair Allen, followed by Jackie Bailey. As other speakers have all mentioned, uh, the fuel poverty in Scotland remains a significant problem throughout the country, uh, in spite of the, the billion pounds uh, investment in uh, uh, energy efficiency measures, uh, which uh, SNP governments will have committed uh, to dealing with the problem uh, over uh, the last few parliaments. But I make no apology for pointing to some of the particular problems that face my own constituency and I'm sure other island constituencies too. In 2016, the rate of fuel poverty in the Western Isles was calculated at some 56% according to the Scottish Housing Conditions Survey. Now, some of the reasons for that are obvious enough. The windchill factor, which is not recognised in the system of cold weather payments, the ageing population, the preponderance of detached houses, but perhaps as significant as anything else uh, is the unavailability of mains gas anywhere in the islands uh, except in one relatively small area of one town, Stornoway. But history isn't irrelevant here either. Government assistance in the 1930s and 1940s was aimed at getting people out of the thatched black houses. This resulted in a generation of home-built houses made of poured concrete, generally mixed with shingle from island beaches to form walls with no cavities. And another wave of kit house building took place in the 1970s and 80s. In short, few of the houses built in the islands throughout the great part of the 20th century are anything like thermally efficient. Now, many people in this situation may, on the face of it, be homeowners. The reality in the islands is, as often as not, that they own the house, but not the land underneath it, a feature of crofting tenure too complicated to explain to virtually any building society, meaning that many people are living in houses which they simply can't afford to repair. And then there are all the usual problems, by no means specific to islands, that people have to contend with. Low incomes, universal credit rollout, a shortage of affordable rented housing, and above all, uh, uh, the spiralling cost of energy over the last 15 years or so, which uh, the Minister has pointed to himself. Now, I see from uh, their report that the Local Government and Communities Committee saw all these problems for themselves firsthand when they visited my constituency recently, and I very much welcome them doing so. 
So uh, I warmly welcome, too, the Minister's uh, commitment today to recognise rural and specifically island, perhaps, factors uh, in the rural miss uh, uh, going forward. And I also welcome the fact that the, the bill will be subject to an island's impact assessment. And I hope that uh, the Minister will be able to say something, perhaps, in his summing up about whether the strategy following the bill uh, will be subjected to a similar proofing process and what distinctive island factors it might be possible to recognise uh, in our strategy on fuel poverty going forward. For example, in defining an acceptable standard of living once fuel costs are met, um, I hope there will be room in future, as has been uh, positively indicated today, I think, um, to um, take account of some of the extra costs involved uh, in living in an island area. Not least uh, among these is that if you're looking for work, it is in many island areas simply not a realistic option not to have a car. There are many people in island communities who would not consider themselves able to afford a car if they lived elsewhere, but feel they have absolutely no choice if looking for work. And this is before higher food, petrol and other prices are considered. But there are other things too that people in most parts of Scotland, rural and urban, take for granted. Most Scots can visit a relative in hospital uh, if they are suddenly taken uh, uh, seriously ill perhaps, or perhaps go to a funeral in another part of the country. In the islands, because a plane fare goes up exponentially if bought a day or two before you travel, making such a visit can often cost as much as a foreign holiday. Presiding officer, it is right that this parliament is held responsible for the things that are within our control and uh, in that the major investment in energy efficiency, particularly in older people's houses, should be recognised and welcomed. It's right too, however, and other me members have mentioned this, that we scrutinise areas that are out with our devolved control too, such as the significant rise in the cost of fuel uh, and the fuel poverty which is traceable directly to changes in the benefit system. I want to end, uh, however, by expressing a hope that island proofing might come to recognise another specific problem uh, that all off-grid areas have, and that is why are the energy efficiency ratings used in EPCs measured in pounds sterling uh, and not in kilowatts of energy used per square metre. Being off the gas grid makes the cost by definition more, uh, but says little about the energy efficiency of the building, and the result is that homeowners in off-grid areas face often impossible tasks in getting to band C compared to the task faced by people who are on grid. All that said, I very much welcome the bill and the government's clear commitment to making it work in the islands and across Scotland to tackle what remains, despite substantial and very welcome efforts by the Scottish Government, one of the single biggest problems that faces my constituents. Thank you very much. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Jamie Halco Johnson. Jackie Bailey. Can I start by declaring an interest as one of the honorary vice presidents of Energy Action Scotland? As the minister in the very first Labour-led Scottish government responsible for establishing the fuel poverty target, I'm very pleased to take part in this debate. Members will perhaps forgive me if I therefore look back, because I think we can always learn from history. It was, of course, Section 88 of the Housing Scotland Act 2001 that committed Scottish ministers to ensuring that so far as reasonably practicable, that people are not living in fuel poverty by November 2016. An ambitious target, one in which all parties across the parliament agreed, and indeed Stuart Maxwell, who served as the SNP minister from 2007, said, we signed up enthusiastically to the previous administration's target, which was bold when it was established in 2001. This was then the right thing to do, and successor administrations agreed. Now, you don't often find issues which transcend the political divide, so it is therefore disappointing with that level of consensus that we singularly failed to meet the target. So where did it go wrong? Back in March 2008, a member's debate on fuel poverty thought the target was tough but achievable. Later that same year, Nicola Sturgeon, as Deputy First Minister, reconvened the Scottish Fuel Poverty Forum to advise ministers on how to refocus the policy and better use the resources available to achieve the target. We were all still talking about eradicating fuel poverty and achieving the target. Of course, there were increases in fuel prices and factors that we don't entirely control. But we didn't think 
that this was a barrier to doing all we could to achieve the target. Not one SNP or indeed other member across this chamber raised that as an issue when we set the original target. Three years later, in 2011, some five years before the target date, Members of the Scottish Fuel Poverty Forum were telling anyone who would listen to them, from ministers to parliamentary committees, that unless there was a substantial increase in resource, we would fail to meet the 2016 target. The spending levels back in 2012-13 were £65 million. The Economy Committee, in their budget scrutiny, believed that the budget needed to be in the order of £100 to £170 million per year if we were to succeed in eradicating fuel poverty. Unfortunately, the government decided that they knew better. Budget after budget, opposition members made this point. Indeed, I recall Patrick Harvey bringing down the government's budget one year on this very point. In some years, there were even underspends, but the sums fell well short of what was required. By 2012, in a second, by 2012, very few people believed the target could be met and ministers did very little to try and change that. I'll take the intervention. Annabelle Ewing. Thank you for the intervention. Um, obviously, as we've heard, the increase in, in, in energy prices was not a, a de minimis increase. It was an increase of 158%. Is the member trying to suggest that that had no impact at all on, on the issue? Jackie Beale. I'm indeed not suggesting that. But what we did is we ignored the fact that this had had an impact and we failed to address what we needed to do to then recalibrate in order to meet the target. It's not good enough to say it's somebody else's fault and we do nothing to try and change that. So on reflection, I'm very clear that you need to start with an ambitious target. You need a route map for how to achieve it. You need to monitor implementation closely. You also need enough money in the budget to realize your ambitions, parliamentary ownership, and maybe even some independent oversight so that ministers' feet are held to the fire when necessary to do so. But let me turn to the current bill. The target of taking fuel poverty down to 5% by 2040 is, in my view, lacking in ambition. Taking the number of fuel poor from now to the target date means a reduction of 1% a year. That makes snail's pace look fast and condemns another generation to fuel poverty. The target should be 2032. Changing the definition is also very troubling. Scottish Government has changed its methodology and analysis at least to four or five times. And on each occasion, more people in fuel poverty got measured out. With the greatest respect, redefining fuel poverty or changing the methodology to simply take people out of the equation fiddles the figures whilst Rome burns. Now, people tell me that pensioners, it's not nonsense, people tell me that pensioners and people living in rural areas suffer most from fuel poverty. Yet the Scottish Government has moved the definition from 60, where it currently is, to 75. The Minister will, of course, be aware that many people in Scotland do not reach the age of 75, particularly those in disadvantaged areas, but they still live in acute fuel poverty. At stage one, the Minister said he would consult on this in bringing forward regulations, but I think we should know the government's intentions now. And I would be interested to know if he would rule out shifting the age qualification to as high as 75. Finally, presiding officer, others have touched on minimum income standards, and I agree with the comments from Andy Whiteman. I want to spend the short time remaining talking about monitoring. Parliament, of course, must have an active role, but let me suggest to the minister that rather than having the Scottish Fuel Poverty Advisory Forum on an ad hoc basis, it should be given statutory underpinning and be independent of ministers. I listened carefully to what the minister said, but I am not persuaded by his argument. Give them the tools and the teeth to do their job. Presiding officer, we have a once in a generation opportunity to alleviate and eradicate fuel poverty. I welcome the steps being taken in this bill, but there is an opportunity to do so much more. When this parliament was created, it sees those opportunities to be bold, to be ambitious, to change the policy landscape, and to be positive about the future for the people of Scotland. 20 years on, let's not be timid about this. Let's not condemn another generation to having to choose between heating and eating. Let's seize the opportunity to eradicate fuel poverty in Scotland. Thank you, and I call Jamie Halker-Johnson to be followed by Kenneth Gibson.
Sorry, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, my region, the Highlands and Islands, is where fuel poverty, by any reasonable definition, find itself most pronounced. As many members will be aware, a number of factors contribute to the problems that the region faces in this regard. The, combina the combination of a slightly less hospitable climate in some seasons, limitations of the, ma the mains gas network, the wider economic challenges of the region, and an aging population, they are all relevant. When considered against the backdrop of, a higher living of higher living costs in less densely populated areas, a problem shared with uh, other remote and rural parts of Scotland, fuel poverty clearly has a regional element to it and is an issue of particular relevance to my constituents. To illustrate this with some examples, Orkney and the Western Isles have the sorry record of being the lo local authorities in Scotland where over 50% of households are in fuel poverty under the current definition. Of the five local authorities with the highest proportion of households without mains gas, all of them are in the Highlands and Islands. They also find themselves near the bottom of the table for energy efficiency measures. And if we set aside the island authorities who have their own particular needs, it's the Highland Council area and Murray Council that experience the highest levels of fuel poverty on mainland Scotland. I'd like to get on, please. And where levels of, of this are high, fuel poverty can become less visible. Many people in these communities, particularly older people, would not immediately identify themselves as being in fuel poverty, regardless of where statistical definitions place them. High energy costs and lower dispensable, uh, disposable incomes can often uh, be treated as a fact of life. Policy, policy makers may think that makes them a less pressing problem, but individuals, families, and the wider economy are impacted just the same. Individuals are left making those same unpleasant and undesirable trade-offs in order to heat their homes adequately. Now, before turning to some of the conclusions of the Stage 1 report, I would like to extend my thanks to the committee for what has been a comprehensive and informative piece of work. And the report identifies and notes a number of these localised concerns that I have raised. One area that the committee uh, was right to highlight is the issue around extreme fuel poverty. As other speakers have observed, there is a real risk that national or even local authority level targets can create perverse outcomes, outcomes where the low hanging fruit is tackled first and those in the greatest need abandoned. So I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to bring forward proposals at stage two and we'll, we will be looking at them in some detail. The committee report also quoted the evidence of Alistair Calder of uh, Argyll and Butte Council who spoke of the need to avoid a situation in 2040 where its 5% of homes still in fuel poverty were all located either on the islands or in rural areas with his council area, within his council area. It's not simply a question of the worst cases being deprioritized, but also the potential not to address areas which, by their geography, are difficult and potentially more expensive to reach. The committee also addressed the local issues around the use of the minimum income standard. That remote and rural areas have particular problems is not controversial. The Scottish Government's early conclusion that these, uh, that these are accounted for in the MIS or that additional costs of, a gather, of gathering better data would be prohibitive seems to have been largely contradicted by the committee's evidence. So I welcome the Minister's comments today on Islands Ms. The committee also heard assurances from the Minister that he will look seriously at an uplift for remote and rural areas. And again, I'm pleased that he appears to have done that. It is important that his assessments can be scrutinised, though, effectively by this Parliament and that if he wants to build cross-party support, this work is taken forward seriously. Because these changes are not to be taken lightly. If we consider the relevant, relevant uh, relative impact of the proposals, the number of older households who are in fuel poverty uh, will be deemed to have fallen by 137,000 at the stroke of a pen. And some 60,000 with a long-term sickness or disability will be removed from the statistics. From a regional perspective, many of those removed from the fuel poverty statistics would be in my region. This has unsurprisingly caused some alarm to organisations locally, and I've met and heard on this point from housing associations, local authorities and individuals. Because it is important that the message we send to these people in rural Scotland is not that we think their problems have been solved, even though their circumstances remain the same. I also welcome the, Scottish, uh, the government's commitment that an island's impact assessment will be brought forward on the various aspects of the bill. This is important in meeting the Scottish government's commitment to the islands, in this, a policy area where the islands are so clearly distinct from mainland Scotland, it is extremely important that this process is undertaken and can command the confidence of these communities. Where I will express disappointment, as previous colleagues already have, is in the downgrading of this bill from a more rounded warm homes bill. This is a missed opportunity for a comprehensive approach to tackling these issues. 
Unfortunately, the Scottish Government's efforts have often appeared, from these benches at least, to be unfocused. Major policy areas like the creation of a publicly owned energy company seem to be created as sound bites first, with even the key details and direction to be ironed out later. There is a pressing need to address energy efficiency further and the considerable regional disparities that exist. So, presiding officer, it is welcome that the government is willing to move on this bill. I will be joining my Scottish Conservative colleagues in looking to strengthen it. But I emphasize that there must be serious consideration of the areas that have been raised by the committee if ministers want to see wider support. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Kenneth Gibson before we move to closing speeches, beginning with Claudia Beamish. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As a member of the Local Government and Communities Committee, I was pleased to work with colleagues in the production of the Stage 1 report into this important bill, which has the potential to have a hugely positive impact on the lives of thousands of households across Scotland. In 2017, 613,000 Scottish households, a quarter, were classified as living in fuel poverty. The previous Scottish executive had hoped to eliminate fuel poverty. However, despite their best intentions and those of their successors, fuel price increases of 155% compared to wage growth of 38% over that period, of which they had no control stymied these efforts. The increase in the default tariff 13 days ago by £110, highlighted by Polly McNeill earlier, highlighted this. The principal aims of the Fuel Poverty Bill are to set out a new target for a, a dramatic reduction in fuel poverty that is both ambitious and achievable, to introduce a new definition of fuel poverty so that support can reach those who need it most, and to produce a, no, a new long-term fuel poverty strategy, obliging Scottish ministers to publish and lay uh, periodic reports to Parliament every five years. Stakeholders agreed that enshrining a target in legislation would provide a clear endpoint against which to measure progress. Well, some may ask why the aim is not completely, to completely eradicate fuel poverty, the 5% target takes into account the Scottish Government's limited influence in relation to two of the four main drivers of fuel poverty, household income and energy costs. Also, the transient nature of fuel poverty, which sees some households move in and out of the definition, again due to circumstances which this Government uh, cannot control. Uh, by setting a realistic target for 2040, which uh, I understood all committee members of all parties had agreed to, certainly in the report there, were no, uh, there was no dissent. While laying the groundwork of a sustainable, well-designed long-term strategy provides an opportunity to reduce fuel poverty even further. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased the Scottish Government has agreed to enshrine interim target milestones into the legislation at stage two so we can assess how well the strategy is working. Yes, indeed. Andy Whiteman. Kenneth Gibson for taking that <coughs> intervention. I mean, he'll be well aware, I think he's been in this place for quite some time, that committee members do their best to bring forward reports that we can all agree with as, as, the, as the will of the committee, which does not mean to say that members of various parties, when it comes to debates at stage one or amendments at stage two or debates at stage three, may take a different view. He seems to be insinuating that we shouldn't be. Kenneth Gibson. The thing is that all seven members of the committee agreed to the 2040 date without even a scintilla of dissent, to my understanding, and yet somehow some members are coming here pretending that all along they really supported 2032. I think that's fundamentally dishonest. If you're against something you, uh, in a report, you dissent from it. Uh, for example, your colleague in the CTEA committee dissented against six other M MSPs who supported one view and two who abstained. I think that's the way to do it. You don't say, oh, I, 2040 is great, and then you come to the, the, the chamber and say it's no radical. Enough. I think that's just fundamentally dishonest, so I'm sorry I disagree with you on that. Um, I mean, our evidence wasn't, of course, limited to views heard in this building, President Officer. Members visited both Dundee and the Western Isles to hear firsthand from people about their lived experiences of fuel poverty. On Lewis, we heard from a woman working three part-time jobs and relying on her credit card just to get by. Her traditional single breeze block cottage had a wood-burning stove and storage heaters. She was not on the gas grid, which is limited, as Alistair Allen said, to Stornoway. Having left the island for work, renting at her home, upon her return, the house was in poor condition because the previous tenants could not afford to heat it, damaging white goods with dampness in the walls. The woman received excellent support from local organisation Tyne and Segal, which arranged for external wall insulation. And this remedied a situation quickly becoming unbearable. When we heard from a man living in a 100-year-old croft house with thick stone walls and small windows, after cavity wall insulation and new storage heaters, he reported it felt like a new home, while also making a significant difference to his fuel bills. The experience uh, uh, shared by people in fuel poverty demonstrates the harsh reality of being fuel poor and reaffirmed the committee's view that this legislation is essential. We know fuel bills are generally higher in island communities, not just in the Western Isles, uh, but in Arran and Cumbria and my own constituency and on other islands. 
There can be for a variety of factors, including the lack of connection to the grass grid, increased exposure to wind and weather, over-reliance on electricity and unregulated fuel types, and older, hard-to-heat homes. The starkest disparity, as we've heard, heard uh, be uh, between regions is in, from the Orkney Islands with 58.7% of households and Edinburgh with 20.1%. That is why, while the committee welcomes the revised definition of fuel poverty set in the bill, based around the calculation of minimum income standard that takes into account of daily living costs, the MIS definition may not adequately take into account the reality of living in islands or remote rural areas disproportionately affected by fuel poverty. I therefore welcome the Minister's commitment uh, uh, to an additional minimum income standard ahead of Stage 2. And I also welcome uh, his commitment to an island's assessment to be published by the end of April. Delivering a meaningful reduction in fuel poverty requires a concerted effort uh, um, from everyone, from local government, businesses, third sector, landlords, tenants and homeowners. Of course, no legislation exists in a vacuum and this bill will intersect the aims of the climate change, the new, uh, the new energy efficient programme, the energy efficient route map and the draft fuel poverty strategy mandated by the fuel poverty bill. This suite of policies will both reduce fuel poverty and improve home energy efficiency while reducing carbon emissions. Indeed, presiding officer, by the end of 2021, this government will have allocated over £1 billion since 2009 to tackling fuel poverty and improving energy efficiency. Jackie Bailey talked about £65 million being invested in 2012. Well, it was £113 million last year, so there has been a significant uh, increase despite uh, challenging uh, finances. Uh, um, financial challenges to this uh, government. By achieving our challenging target of reducing fuel poverty 5%, we will not only be one of just a handful of countries around the world to do so, more importantly, we will draw ever closer to a fairer Scotland, a Scotland where nobody is forced to choose between heating and eating. And if Jackie Bailey had intervened there, I would have taken her, but of course, I'm now over my time. Thank you, President. <coughs> Thank you, and, you and I call, we move to closing speeches now. I call on Claudia Beamish to wind up for the Labour Party. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This has been a significant Stage 1 debate with many important issues highlighted across the Chamber. Like colleagues, I welcome the draft Fuel Poverty uh, Scotland Bill. It occurs to me that this Chamber has denounced fuel poverty as Scotland's shame countless times, and yet hundreds of thousands of households still battle against its effects. It is unacceptable that across Scotland, people sit down to weigh up warming, up, warming their homes or filling their stomachs of an evening. Liam MacArthur stressed as well the range of health and education downsides of living in fuel poverty. How is an elderly person to protect their health in a drafty room? How is a child to excel at school when their home is distractingly cold? And how can a carer support their loved one in a home with pitiful insulation? Can I remind the Chamber that the right to adequate housing is enshrined to us in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? In Scotland, we clearly feel the changing seasons, and so here, adequate must equal warm. As Jackie Bailey stressed, there, is a, there was a consensus to eradicate fuel poverty by 2016, and her historic analysis was indeed chilling. Where is the recalibration that is needed? I would argue that the Scottish Government has not done enough for this, and it is to the eternal shame of this Government that this is the case. But now, no, I'm not taking intervention on that point, thank you, but I've made that point and so has Jackie Bailey and I think that point was well made. So now we are in a position where we do have a fuel poverty bill. But further, I share our, my colleagues' very serious concern that the remaining 5% left in fuel poverty will be those households most difficult to tackle, who have already suffered for decades. I do welcome the Minister's commitment to a definition of extreme fuel poverty. The existing Homes Alliance is, of course, a very broad and significant coalition. It has stressed, I quote, the need to take the higher cost of remote and rural living into account. And this is frankly a relief that the Stage 1 report recognised a new definition proposed within the, the bill does not adequately take this into account. And I strongly welcome the Minister's commitment on a rural amendment uh, at Stage 2. It is vital to ensure an uplift for rural dwellers and the fact that the, um, the bill will be island-proofed as committed to by the Minister today and stressed by Liam MacArthur and Alistair Allen and others is of vital importance. As an MP for South, MSP rather, for South Scotland, I'm keenly aware of the challenges faced by those living in rural fuel poverty, often off-grid, often in hard-to-heat old stone houses. So the Scottish Government might consider how it can help 
uh, to, to give collective and cooperative rural support. And this might be part of the strategy, if not on the face of the bill, especially for low carbon energy solutions such as biomass. More widely, cooperative and mutual models of energy production, distribution and sale have a role to play in tackling fuel poverty beyond this bill. And they are a means to empower the fuel poor, disadvantaged and excluded communities when Britain's energy system is not working for consumers. And I accept that part of this are, res are reserved issues, uh, but Pauline McNeill has highlighted the problems for larger families who could see uh, annual bills rise by up to £184 a year. And the market may be broken uh, thanks to a combination of lack of competition resulting in market dominance by a small number of large vertically integrated companies, unsustainable and short-term decisions being made by big business and a housing stock that ranks among the least energy efficient in Europe. But consumer, local government and community employment ownership models have been shown to offer uh, behavioural benefits as people have more, uh, more consideration of their own energy use and they are also offering economic benefits with returns remaining in the locality when reinvested and also helping with job creation. So we need a fuel poverty bill for sure, for the sake of people's health, well-being, financial equality, but also for our efforts to tackle climate change. And the narrow scope of the bill means it does not deliver specifically on lowering climate change emissions for housing, although I do welcome the Minister's commitment to find the way forward on reporting duties with COSLA and, and the committee, parallel with the um, present climate change reporting duties. So, my colleague Pauline McNeill has also explored the private rented sector um, in her opening remarks for Scottish Labour. And there has long been concern for those in homes where the chance to improve energy efficiently relies not wholly on the residents in the residents' hands, for example, in the private rented sector. And I welcome the work done by the Scottish Parliament Working Group on ten Tenement uh, Maintenance and Energy Efficiency for Common Improvements is an important part of this. I do want to highlight that in 2014, I tried to amend the housing bill at stage two and three to add a duty to, um, uh, for provision of energy efficiency standards to the repairing standard, but that was not supported by the Scottish Government. Though at that time, I withdrew my amendments on the understanding that this issue would be tackled altogether with other energy efficiency concerns. So I hope, although this is a complex issue, this will not be used as an excuse to avoid tackling this. This should be seen as an opportunity at stage two and beyond. I hope, the Scottish government, I hope the Scottish Government will engage with those of us who are keen to address multi-occupancy and the private rented sector, which is the case across um, the parties, as I understand it. So Scottish Labour does indeed welcome this new bill and supports the general principles of the Fuel Poverty Bill, but there is a lot of room for improvement, and the Minister has acknowledged some of this today on the basis of the Local Government Committee's report. However, we still have, in the view of Scottish Labour, a considerable way to go. Thank you. Thank you, and I call on Alexander Stewart to wind up for the Conservative Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to have the opportunity to close the Stage 1 debate on the Fuel Poverty Target Definition and Strategy Bill on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Our manifesto in advance of the 2016 Scottish Parliament elections made it clear that the Scottish Conservatives are committed to ensuring that no one lives in a hard-to-heat home and to reducing fuel poverty. We are therefore happy to support the broad principles of the bill before us today. More specifically, we pledge to make the case that to transform investment in, in Scotland in energy efficiency homes across Scotland. And we suggested that it could be done by investing up to 10% of Scotland's government's capital budget allocations in energy efficiency measures. This could lead to thousands of jobs all across Scotland while making homes easy to heat, reducing energy bills and carbon emissions. There is certainly the need for this bill at this time to tackle the issue that is driven by the complex uh, combination of energy costs energy efficiency, household incomes and energy use. At present, a quarter of households in Scotland live in fuel poverty. We've heard that today. And we've also talked about the rural and island communities. And our convener, James Donnan, commented on that. And I'm delighted to hear uh, that Kevin Stewart will be bringing forward uh, uh, amendments in stage two to cover some of the areas uh, within our rural and island communities. And as a member myself of the Local Government and Communities Committee, it has been a real privilege to hear from groups from individuals 
uh, and organisations who have all uh, ensured that we have been given the ability to hear their views and opinions. And prior to the debate this afternoon, we've had the opportunity to have, from many members, uh, the opportunity of having their very useful uh, briefings that give their views and opinions. And previous attempts to drive down this issue by uh, successive governments has been unsuccessful. And we've heard from Jackie Bailey today about what that attempt to do when it was set out uh, back in 2002 and how up to 2016 they wanted to ensure that that happened. Well, it didn't happen for various reasons. Uh, and we've heard some of that already this afternoon. But it is important uh, that the local government uh, committee and communities across Civic Scotland uh, want to support this bill because they see the needs for things to happen. The bill as it stands does, however, include... Uh, it doesn't include any accountability mechanisms. And that was one of the key flaws back in 2016 when this bill was set out. Uh, in other words, there needs to be some form of consequences for the Scottish Government if targets of this bill fail to be met. Otherwise, it will be ambitious. Uh, I'd like to continue to make progress. Uh, otherwise, uh, the ambitions will not be met uh, and we'll just end up with some sort of simple, meaningless uh, propositions going forward. And I don't want that to happen, presiding officer. We want to ensure that this bill is successful. So there will need to be some amendments and changes to it as it goes forward. Moreover, it is disappointing uh, that there is not an interim target set out uh, in, the, in the situation, and that was talked about through the draft fuel poverty strategy. Both uh, the committee and stakeholders who were represented in the consultation made some clear uh, support about the strategy underpinning such a milestone. And indeed, the committee requires uh, to do that to ensure that we get a target date by 2040. And I note from the Minister uh, for Local Government and Plan that he does propose to bring forward amendments in stage two. And as I've said earlier, I welcome that because that's what we need to assure uh, that that does take place. And by using a nationwide target, uh, it could have uh, the fact of uh, uh, ensuring that regional disparity takes place. And the committee suggested uh, that the Scottish Government at the they should amend uh, Section 1 and put in place some statutory targets for each local authority to reduce fuel poverty in areas. Uh, and that, as I say, uh, should also be considered. We've heard uh, from many members this afternoon, and Graham Simpson talked about uh, the, uh, the ability that this bill should be there to eradicate fuel poverty, but it will only set a target. Uh, we talk about the lack of ambition, uh, and it's a step in the right direction, but it's only a step in the right direction at this point. Uh, my colleague Alexander Burnett talked about the focus of the bill and the need for the targets to be valid uh, and for a target to be obtainable and also spoke about the standardisation and the support for rural and remote households. Within the debate today, uh, Presiding Officer, we've had many people who've made a very valid contribution and I think that shows the depth and the feeling of this whole issue uh, across uh, the chamber and across Scotland. Jamie Halco Johnson talked about missed opportunities. He talked about his own Highland region where fuel poverty is at the highest, where people have to just accept it's a fact of life. It should not be a fact of life for individuals and communities the length and breadth of Scotland. Polly McNeill uh, talked about the bill being how it falls short uh, and it doesn't give uh, the ambition that she had hoped and the Labour Party had hoped to see. Uh, and Andy Whiteman talked about the unacceptable level of fuel poverty. We all have to acknowledge that there's an unacceptable level of fuel poverty. So that it's vitally important that we look at how that in, we can enhance the, the reporting and we can enhance the support. Liam MacArthur spoke about the, uh, addressing rural and island areas uh, and the lack of ambition. Uh, you know, he talked about heating a home or eating. To some people, that's a fact of life. They are put in that situation. So in conclusion, presiding officer, we in the Scottish Conservatives are committed to tackling fuel poverty and to reduction of carbon emissions overall. As I have indicated, whilst we support the general principles of the bill, there is still a number of important changes that will require to be used as we move forward. We shall therefore support the bill at stage one today, but we will seek to make amendments to strengthen the bill at stage two or three, because that's the right thing to do, and we ensure that we will all be working together to achieve that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on the Minister, Kevin Stewart, to conclude our debate. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, as I said at the very outset of this debate, the government is ambitious in its de desire uh, to tackle, reduce and ultimately eliminate fuel poverty in Scotland. Uh, beyond that, uh, we also have to ensure um, that we reduce carbon um, here in our country uh, and we need to move forward in terms of delivery uh, of technologies to ensure um, that this 
um, is, becomes a reality. Um, so this bill is not a standalone. Um, it goes hand in hand uh, with the carbon reduction bill, which we will uh, see uh, coming to this place very shortly. Uh, and it goes hand in hand uh, with the bill that Mr. Wheelhouse will introduce uh, around about uh, district heating uh, and local heating strategies. And beyond the bills themselves, um, I would draw members' attention um, to uh, the draft energy strategy uh, and, of course, the Energy uh, Efficiency Scotland um, uh, pipeline. And it is within uh, Energy Efficiency Scotland, uh, the route map, where we lay out um, our ambitious targets uh, to deal with fuel poor homes uh, in terms of EPC ratings. Uh, and fuel poor homes should reach EPC band C by 2030 and EPC band B by 2040. Uh, and these will act as a, a guide um, for our delivery programmes, ensuring that delivery to fuel poor households is prioritised. I'll take Mr Simpson. Graeme Simpson. I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. Uh, he'll have heard during this debate uh, concerns from a number of members about uh, EPC ratings, in, including Alistair Allen, um, and their effectiveness. Um, is, he, is that something he's willing to look at on a, a Scottish basis? Yes. President Officer, can I say that building standards officials at this moment are looking at EPC ratings. Uh, this is part of the ongoing day-to-day -day work that we do uh, as a government. We keep all of these things under review. Um, I'm quite happy uh, to hear from members uh, around about their views. Um, I remember uh, getting the letter from Mr. Burnett around about his constituent uh, and his uh, situation around about EPC. If folk want to feed in, I will make sure that that goes to building standards officials and plays a part in terms of the work that they are doing at this moment in time. Um, President officer, so this is not a standalone bill. It is part of a suite of legislation and regulation that we must bring forward to do our level best for the people of Scotland. And I don't want anyone to be living in a fuel poor household because I remember when I was a child um, in a house which was heated by a two bar fire in the living room and a super serre um, heater upstairs with the bedroom doors open to try and get the heat through uh, and ice, uh, and uh, I am lucky compared to some, uh, and ice forming um, uh, in the inside of the windows through no fault of my parents, through no fault of my parents who were doing their level best. I don't want anyone to be in those circumstances. And I want to move as quickly as we can on these issues. But we also have to be realistic about what is deliverable. We need to be realistic about what we can achieve in certain timescales. Now, you know, I've heard a lot today um, which differs from the um, report from the committee about um, moving further and faster um, on some of these targets. Uh, what I have not heard is how we deliver that quicker. How do we achieve that deliverability? Because I, as I've said time and time again, what we have put in place here um, is ambitious and it is deliverable just. It is stretching. So those folks who are thinking of putting forward amendments about bringing forward targets are going to have to look at how that can be delivered. Uh, I'll give way to Ms McNeill. Polly McNeill. So the Minister asks the parties to consider, well, how do we deliver this? So I ask you, Minister, then, would you consider what I said in my opening speech, that the delivery part of this bill could do with a bit more content? And if the Minister's open-minded about accepting amendments about how we deliver the detail of reducing uh, fuel poverty, will he consider substantially amending that section of the bill? Yes. Of this is not necessarily in the bill at all. It is in delivering energy efficient Scotland and adapting as we move forward. It's making sure that that draft um, fuel poverty strategy becomes a strategy that works for all. I think that sometimes in this place we get a little bit fixated with primary legislation. 
um, and it is very difficult at points to create primary legislation uh, to create delivery. And I think that these documents and the scrutiny of these things as we move forward are important, extremely important. And these are going to be the key things to ensure um, that we reach um, the targets um, that we aspire to. Um, uh, very briefly from Ms. Beamish. Thank, I thank the Minister for, that for taking the intervention. Would the Minister agree with me, as I highlighted in my closing remarks, the importance of um, local energy work and cooperatives that will actually support not only local jobs, but um, helping people who are in fuel poverty to tackle that? Ms. Absolutely. I, b I believe that if we get this absolutely right in terms of how we progress, we can create um, jobs in this area not just handing jobs to multinational companies, as often happens in the past, but local delivery. Um, the prime example of that is actually in Orkney, um, because when I first got this uh, post, um, uh, civil servants came to me and said that Orkney were unable to spend um, their um, area-based scheme money. Um, and it was suggested that maybe I wanted uh, to take that money back, which I did not do, because Orkney Orkney required a greater length of time than other authorities to set up the, the supply chain and the skills to deliver what was required for Orkney. Now that's the kind of thing that I would like to see across the country um, and if we, if we are in a position where we're pushed to move too quickly, local authorities might not have the ability to go and do what Orkney did in this case and maybe pushed into um, uh, setting uh, procurement elsewhere, uh, maybe places uh, that Ms Beamish does not want to see. So there is absolutely a, a logic to taking time in some aspects of this to get it absolutely right. However, as I say, if anybody comes forward with a delivery plan um, which uh, 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 works uh, to bring targets forward, I will certainly look at that and consider that as we move forward. Um, I've listened uh, to the committee and we have made um, uh, some moves, uh, which uh, I'm pleased to hear that folk are happy about, uh, around about interim targets um, and around about uh, minimum income standards. Um, and I, I, I think one of the key things in all of this though, uh, is the tackling of extreme fuel poverty. Uh, and I will, without doubt, uh, bring forward those amendments at stage two. I have said to members that I will continue to listen. Uh, I think that the reason why there has been movement is not just the work of the committee, but the engagement that there has been between members, myself, um, and uh, uh, stakeholders at large. And that will continue um, as we progress, not just with this bill, but in terms of energy efficient Scotland, in terms of reaching the right fuel poverty strategy, and in terms of the other bills too, um, as we move forward. Uh, Mr MacArthur, yeah. Lee MacArthur. I'm very grateful to the Minister for taking intervention. Um, following on from what Polly McNeill was saying about the access to the funds that are available, I know that um, there are... Yes, we have a bit of order in the chamber, please. Sorry, less the, less the, conversations, let's listen to Mr MacArthur. Uh, Pauline McNeill was highlighting some of the difficulties there are in accessing funds. There are those who are in listed properties who find it exceptionally difficult to introduce measures. Would he speak to his colleagues uh, to ensure that uh, heritage and fuel poverty objectives are better aligned than they appear to be at the moment? Yes, sir. Um, heritage and fuel poverty bo bodies greater aligned certainly do that. Uh, I'm uh, well aware that in Mr Arthur MacArthur's constituency uh, we've got council housing that did, uh, dates back to the Napoleonic area. Um, so, uh, you know, these are much more difficult to deal with. Uh, in terms of that point that uh, uh, Ms McNeill made about the joined up approach, uh, my suggestion is that everybody talks to Home Energy Scotland. The helpline there are absolutely fantastic. Uh, they are an award-winning helpline. They will guide people to the right places and give folks um, the right advice in that regard. But again, I'm more than willing to speak to Ms McNeill and others around about where they think the difficulties lie in terms of folks accessing grant um, and or loan funding. Because I want to make that journey as easy as possible for people. So if she wants to have that conversation, uh, I am more than happy uh, to do so. Um, Presiding officer, um, there have been a, a few 
uh, myths today which I, I, I really uh, need to touch upon. Uh, Ms Bailey in her speech uh, talked about modelling and, anal and analysis being changed uh, four or five times each time uh, taking more households out of fuel poverty. Modelling and analysis that has been done has only happened to reflect in the changes to industry standards uh, and energy modelling uh, and no other reason than that at all and that has I'll, I'll take you very briefly I, I really, really feel that I shouldn't I, I, I am very grateful to the minister for doing so and let me be brief he said that when I accused him of changing the methodology and the analysis that that was nonsense he's now admitting I was right and on each occasion will he tell the chamber that actually more people were taken out of fuel poverty even though their experience continued to be in fuel poverty minister what I was saying was nonsense, as she was saying that the modelling and analysis uh, took more, put more folk in fuel poverty. That was the absolute nonsense that Ms Bailey was speaking. And, you know, this, this is, this is, this is the, 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 the member who introduced um, the original bill. And, you know, one of the things which maybe happened then was there was not foresight at that point about possibilities and uh, uh, about um, scrutiny and I, I, I think she should reflect on that as well. We need to get this absolutely right. Presiding officer, I'm going to finish on a, a number of points which have been touched upon by some members but seem to have been lost to others and that is the fact that we do not have control uh, over all of the uh, levers that lead to fuel poverty. We do not have control um, of energy prices. I wish we did. Uh, we do not have control over incomes. And even though Mr. Uh, Whiteman made an attempt uh, to say that we have a small amount of leverage there, we don't have uh, the ability to deal with things that happen uh, from the UK government, like changes uh, in VAT, well, like poor rollout of universal credit, like the slashing of social security, and the list goes on. These are things that we should be uniting on as a parliament so that we have control of, uh, over every aspect of that so that we can truly move forward to ensure that we are doing the very best uh, for the people of Scotland. Um, President officer, I am grateful uh, to the committee for their efforts. Um, I find it a bit surprising that many uh, of the uh, contributions today have not been reflective of the uh, committee's report, but we are where we are. Uh, I'm grateful for views that have been shared uh, in the chamber. Um, I will continue, as I've said, to listen to members and to stakeholders as we move forward. Um, and I hope uh, that we can move forward uh, to stage two in a logical fashion uh, with workable amendments uh, that have no unintended consequences. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on the Fuel Poverty Bill. The next item of business is consideration of Business Motion 15899 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Thank you very much. And no member wishes to speak on the motion. Therefore, I call on... Oh, the question is that motion 15899 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. The next item is consideration of business motions 15901 and 15902 on the stage one timetables for two bills. Again, could I call on Graham Day to move the above mentioned motions? Uh, move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. No member wishes to speak on these motions, therefore the question is that motions 15901 and 15902 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed, thank you. The next item is consideration of a parliamentary bureau motion 15900 on the local government finance order. I ask Graham Day on behalf of the bureau to move this motion. Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. We turn now to decision time. The first question is that motion 15617 in the name of Kezia Dugdale on the Hutchison's Hospital Transfer and Dissolution Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 15892 in the name of Kevin Stewart on the fuel poverty 
Target Definition and Strategy Scotland Bill be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 15900 in the name of Graham Day on the Local Government Finance Scotland Order 2019 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed and that concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly to members' business in the name of Bob Doris on efforts to save St Rollock's Railway Works. But we'll just take a few moments for members and the Minister to change seats. <laughs>